All right, it's time for Lincoln Chapter 4. The Prairies Are on Fire. In 1854, when Congress finally acted again on slavery, the House and Senate voted not to kill or curtail it. They voted to allow it to spread. A new law made it possible for the settlers in the nation's new western territories, places like Kansas and Nebraska, to vote for themselves on whether or not to allow slavery to exist within their borders. This meant that the old Missouri Compromise, which since 1820 had prohibited slavery above the latitude of 36 degrees 30 north, became null and void. The new law was the work of none other than Mary Lincoln's one-time admirer, Stephen A. Douglas. Many politicians thought it was a good idea. After all, America was a democracy. Perhaps a majority rule should decide the issue. They called the new system popular sovereignty. But others, like Lincoln, were infuriated. They argued that no one had the right to spread slavery outside the states where it already existed. They warned that the new law would eventually make slavery legal in every part of the nation. It would destroy the American system of free labor. Hey, by the way, here's a picture of Lincoln from the book. I'll read the caption now. Lincoln holds an anti-slavery newspaper to the camera as he poses in Chicago in 1854, the year he announced his opposition to slavery expansion. That's the caption under there. Douglas's so-called Kansas-Nebraska Act aroused Lincoln, as he put it, to re-enter politics after a five-year retirement. When he began speaking out again, it was on one issue only, the duty of every American to stop the spread of slavery. Slavery, Lincoln once Lincoln told one audience in a famous speech in Peoria that year, is founded in the selfishness of man's nature. Opposition to it is his love for justice. Then he made clear his anger at those like Douglas, who said that they did not care one way or the other about slavery. This declared indifference, but as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemies of free institutions to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many really good men amongst ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty. Lincoln's Peoria speech made clear his differences with Senator Douglas. Equal justice to the South, he pointed out meant to Democrats like Douglas that if you do not object to my taking my hog to Nebraska, therefore I must object to you taking your slave. Now, I admit this is perfectly logical if there is no difference between hogs and people. To Lincoln, the difference between property and human beings was important. In our greedy chase to make profit of the people, he warned, let us beware lest we cancel and tear to pieces even the white man's charter of freedom. With inspiring words like these, Lincoln quickly became one of the most outspoken anti-slavery leaders in the West. His stem-winding speeches, each of which lasted as long as two hours, drew thousands of spectators. He was still a moderate on the slavery issue, not ready yet to support immediate freedom, but at least he had begun interacting with people of color. His Haitian-born barber in Springfield, William de Fleurville, became not only the man who cut his hair, but a legal client as well. Lincoln represented the, represented the successful businessman in many of his affairs. Lincoln's loudest critics still accused him of favoring abolition, of making slavery illegal immediately and all at once. In truth, only a tiny fraction of white Americans of the day so believed. And Lincoln was not yet one of them in the, in the 1850s. Even so, by simply opposing the spread of slavery, he angered many Southerners and also infuriated many people in his own state of Illinois who had moved there from the South. He was growing more popular, but certainly not with everyone. In fact, his political comeback stalled when he lost a contest for an Illinois seat in the U.S. Senate in 1855. Lincoln now found himself to be a man without a political party. The Whigs had become irrelevant. The organization simply faded away, but anti-slavery former Whigs banded together with anti-slavery Democrats, disgusted with their party's tendency to side with the South, and formed a new political party. Lincoln soon joined them. He became a Republican. 
Two years later, in 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court issued one of its most terrifying decisions. A slave named Dred Scott had sued for his freedom, arguing that when his Missouri masters took him from Missouri to the free states of Illinois and Wisconsin, he was no longer a slave. The justices, however, disagreed. Under Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, an elderly slave owner from Maryland, the nation's highest court ruled by a vote of seven to two that whites were entitled to own slaves anywhere in the United States, north or south. People of color, added the court, could never become American citizens. In the most shocking words in the decision, Taney wrote that black people were an inferior order and had no rights which the white man was bound to expect. The Dred Scott decision appalled Abraham Lincoln. He complained that the ruling made human beings seem less than human before the law. He thought it an embarrassment to the entire country and an insult to the original promise of the Declaration of Independence. On a practical level, he feared it would mean that slave owners would now be free to take their slaves anywhere they chose. By now, Lincoln was speaking out against slavery everywhere he could. The Dred Scott decision inspired another round of orations in which Lincoln first began suggesting that anti-slavery Americans might not really have to obey the Supreme Court ruling after all. Because the court's decision was not unanimous and was based on assumed historical facts which were not really true, he said in a speech at Springfield on June 26, it would not be disrespectful to treat the issue as still unsettled. Otherwise, he warned, the court's decision would mean not only that Dred Scott and his wife and daughters were legally not human enough to leave, to have a legal hearing, even if they were free, but that all persons like Dred Scott were rightfully slaves. Worse, it meant that the bondage of the Negro was universal and eternal. The idea that the sacred Declaration of Independence did not apply to people of color, he said, was so contrary to what the nation's founders believed that if they were to rise up from the graves, they could not at all recognize it. Lincoln was yet, Lincoln was not yet by any means prepared to argue for racial equality. In fact, he told a Springfield audience that year that there remained a natural disgust in the minds of nearly all white people to the idea of the races living together. He admitted that the overwhelming majority of whites did not want to vote and eat and sleep and marry others. But he strongly insisted that the Declaration of Independence includes all men, black as well as white. This was considered to be advanced thinking in 1857. Lincoln maintained that he did not, did not have to choose to have a black woman as either a slave or a wife. I can just leave her alone, he declared. In some respects, she certainly is not my equal, but in her natural right to eat the bread she earns with her own hands without asking leave of anyone else, she is my equal and the equal of all others. Lincoln reminded all who would listen that if Senator Douglas and the Democrats had their way, slavery would spread to every state in the Union. I think we'll stop there for today. <laughs>